Right. Hi, Claire. Um, great to connect with you um, this uh, Wednesday during lockdown. Um, this is our very first Chain Conversations as part of the Leaders Meet Diversity series, which we've been running in partnership with Facebook. Um, and the, the plan is that every week we will have a 15 minute conversation with a, a, a women leader within the industry. Um, and then the following week, we'll have a follow up conversation based on some of um, the, the the elements that come out of each week. Um, so we'll be able to keep bringing to um, the industry some inspiration during this uh, challenging time. So I'm delighted that the first um, guest speaker we've got is Claire Briegel, who is the CEO of the International Netball Federation. Um, Claire's got a wealth of experience, so I'm really looking forward to hearing a bit more about your experience, Claire. So Thank I you. suppose let's start with, can you just share a bit about your background and your journey towards becoming the CEO of the International Netball Federation? Um, yes, I'll try, I'll try and do that in a two minute version. Um, yeah. So I've had a fairly, um, uh, I've had a career where I've hopped from sector to sector. So mm -hmm. I didn't start off working in sport. Um, my background sort of university into first job was actually in biotech in the 80s in, in the US. And uh, I, was a, I started off as a scientist, but uh, I had been a, an athlete at university. Um, right. So sport's always been in the background, but wasn't my starting place in the career. So had a fairly traditional, went into the, um, started in research, but quickly moved into commercial sales and marketing. Right. So came back to the UK, worked for ICI, which the company doesn't exist anymore, but was the big chemical company where a lot of graduates had careers um, in the sort of 80s and 90s. Got my grounding sales and marketing there, um, then went to work for one of my customers, um, was uh, moved from being a UK sales manager for Twyford Bathrooms to being marketing director there. So classic sales marketing, always being customer focused, outward facing roles. So those are the kind of themes that go through. Ended up as a managing director of a bedding company, fine bedding company. And then, um, and then went off and did a little loop where I worked for myself for a bit, running an online business. Realized that wasn't for me. I much prefer running things, <laughs> having teams around me. And so uh, started to look at um, interim chief exec jobs. And that's where I took on the netball ones. So, uh, and in that, in that time when I'd been working for myself, I found a bit of time to volunteer in sport. So it was around in the period up to the Olympic Games. So I volunteered in rowing, which was my primary sport through all this time. Yeah. And ended up uh, volunteering at World Championships, World Cups, and, and then the Olympic Games, and, and thought, oh, I wonder if I can apply my business and outward-facing marketing knowledge into the sporting world. And um, yeah. that's how I got the job with Netball, which was, gosh, 2012. I, I became the interim chief exec for International Netball, and I've stayed there pretty much ever since. Um, yeah, so became a permanent member of staff and uh, have managed to combine the sport that I love with the skills that I learned through that pretty traditional sales marketing general management career. Great. And um, as someone who hasn't always worked in the sports industry, do you notice any differences between sort of the sports industry and the way other industries work? Well, there are some lovely differences, which I enjoy every day, which was um, when you work in manufacturing companies or certainly in the period that I was working, we unfortunately spent quite a lot of time shutting factories, laying people off and moving, yeah. moving, moving our um, manufacturing out, uh, offshore. Um, so that was quite a, you know, it's quite nice to be in a growth industry. I mean, sports yeah. has been absolutely a growth industry and people... They are so committed um, and, what, you know, if you cut their arm off in netball, it's, it's netball all the way through. And so that's one key difference is that people are hugely motivated about what they do, which is fantastic. Obviously, we, do, we work a lot more with volunteers than in the, in the private yeah. sector. So most of my workforce in netball, let's say my workforce, our workforce, um, are their volunteers. So we have small, a small number of paid employees. Um, certainly in the international federation world and we rely enormously on that wonderful resource out there all those fabulous volunteers yeah. that spend every evening and weekend doing what they love um so yeah so that's a big difference there um similarities um 
Well, I've always worked in international businesses. Even when I've been in a UK member, I've been a UK member of an international team. So that's the thing that really excites me. That's one of the common common bits that I that I love, and and that's probably probably one of the hardest things in lockdown. I'm I can't I can't travel internationally. I I can interact internationally. I can get all the culture differences, but I but that's the bit I miss. So yeah, so those are probably. So there's lots of themes, um, but, um, but yeah, there are fundamental differences as well. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about leadership and, and what it means to you. As you think of yourself as a, as a leader, what are some of the key principles you like to, to live by as a leader in an organisation? So, um, so I guess I, I, I look at what motivates me. And I think, okay, if I can, if I can engage in my team or, or the people that I'm trying to lead, they might be my employees or they might be, you know, whether, whether it's the, the individual countries that make up the International Federation. I try and think about, put myself in their shoes and think, what is it that, where, where are they right now? And, and that's particularly important in a time of crisis. Yeah. So, so the leadership, you know, the leadership style would be about, it would be about thinking, empathy, um, and using the right the the right tone tone of voice or communication, depending on what's going on. So, mm. so right now leadership's a little bit different. Um, spending more time checking in with people. Um, it's really nice. Such I'm I'm quite enjoying this new kindness. Um, yeah. and I'm finding it uh, motivating my for myself. And and I think this. Um, opportunity we've ha we've had to engage more frequently with our members around the world um with my own team a daily um well i have a team of six based in manchester um sorry i should i should say that again a team of five based in manchester and one in namibia and we oh, wow. come together every day at 10 a.m just to say hi how's it going it's like the it's like the cup of coffee in the office um yeah. and having that time together and it's meant so our colleague in, in Namibia has probably seen more of us in lockdown than we ever did. Yeah. And, and that was really important for her because she was on her own. Um, mm. uh, Self-isolating absolutely on her own. And so, so yeah, so, so, so very much around that. Um, I like to, uh, I really like to help a team, um, if I'm managing a team, building a common vision and then yeah. And I know it sounds a bit trite, but but that's what you've got to do. You've got to have everybody kind of bought in to where where you're trying to get to, mm -hmm. um, and, and that can be quite hard. Some people operate more comfortably in a "tell me what I need to do now." Yeah. Other people like to think about where they're going. So you you've got to kind of. But I think if you haven't got that vision, it's hard to get everybody heading in the right direction, and we might go off piece a bit. Mm. So, that um that vision is important and, and that work again works for me too you have to be a bit careful in, in management and leadership don't you um not to assume everybody is like you do. <laughs> so uh, and that's that can be a challenge sometimes but mm. but yeah so creating that common vision thinking about where people are at and trying to um work out what makes them tick and uh giving them yeah. yeah. When you think about some of the leaders that you've kind of admired along along the way, can you think of specific sort of skills that people had that you really admired and you looked up to as a leader? Oh, uh, definitely. Yes, I have worked for having changed sectors. I've worked in you know yeah. worked with a variety of different people quite a lot. Um, quite often men. Um, mm -hmm. I would say I think that's for women is we're quite often. In organisations where your bosses and uh, the bosses are men, um, yeah. but um, but I've had good bosses and bad bosses, and uh, and and I don't think it's a it's um, I don't think it's about whether they're ma male or female. Mm -hmm. So um, I have examples of of, of both. Um, so for for my own piece of my own personal motivation, I like uh, a leader that gives me space, um, mm -hmm. gives me space to to actually. Um, so help you know again thinks about where we're trying to go and then leaves me to get on and think about how we'll do that so operationally um, and I guess there's a difference you know there is that sort of distinction between leadership and management as well and you know the the leadership is is 
visioning future um, and then the management is how you how you do that day to day and and um, so the bosses that get that balance right is really nice and motivating yeah. for me um, so yes and um, I'm, I'm very fortunate I've got a terrific um, new leader the the chair the uh, the the president of the International Federation in netball who's just come in and and we're developing a very strong working relationship and that's critically important for the relationship between either a chair or a, a president in a federation and the chief exec or secretary general. Yeah. Um, we've got to, you, you know, in any organizational structure, that's got to work really well. Um, yeah, so, so those are the kinds of things that I really appreciate. Clear vision, clear vision now, off you go, go tell me how you're gonna do it and we'll work it, work it through that way. Just thinking about what you said there around, you know, sort of, different horses for courses almost people like you know like to work in different way when you when you think about managing or leading people how how do you go about taking that into consideration and, and making that part of your management style or your leadership style well I guess the first point is you've got to actually understand what motivates your team so um, I'm a great fan of um, annual away days where you get in a facilitator and I know you know it's it's very traditional approach these days but it works um yeah. where you get somebody in that and you do you do this team exercise where you understand how how you how individually how you work and then you understand how that what that means for the whole team so mm -hmm. whether you use a, uh, a management tool like Belbin which assigns team roles like that's where you get your completer finishers and your chairman roles and your plants mm -hmm. and all that, which is a, is a really old tool, but it works really well. Sorry, that's my MBA coming out, you know, <laughs> that's, it. that's, the, that's the tools I've learned along the way. Or whether, you know, I've, I've done some recently with my team around communication styles and okay. about how you give information and how you receive it. And, and then everybody gets assigned a color and depending on what color they are. And so it takes away the aggravation in the team because, and then everybody just understands, oh yeah, you know, so-and-so, Claire's a, Claire's a red or a yellow mm -hmm. and, and I'm, a, I'm a green and we just have to communicate differently. So, yeah. th so using those little tools that uh, um, make you understand how, um, how the person that you're interacting with would prefer to receive the information. Yeah. And I had some really good coaching along the way, um, going back to my days at, at Twire for Bathrooms, where I couldn't get on with a boss at the time and we couldn't work it out. And in the end, we worked out. He, he was, I, I, I was tending to give him too much information. Right. In months, and it was all about giving him the big picture. So he was absolutely, completely, I don't want to know anything down here. Just give me the big yeah. picture. And once we got over that, we got on so much better. So if you can have that mature relationship with whoever you're working with, whether yeah. it's upwards or downwards or sideways or whatever, I don't really like upwards and downwards, but you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's understanding how, how you like to receive and interact and understanding how others like to. It's a much stronger tool than barging your way through with your own personal stuff. So for the, for the sort of, I suppose, um, more junior people that may be listening to this and thinking about, you know, how, how would I go about um, approaching a leader about that? Would you encourage people to, to ask those questions and to kind of encourage the, that, that thought process with their leaders? Yeah, that's quite a brave thing for a very junior person to do. Um, yeah. But if they can, if they can, if they can have that sort of, I mean, the starting point is to have regular conversations that aren't just about the work you're doing. So yeah. if, you, if you're working, you know, if you have an opportunity to say to your boss, can we have, can we have just 10 minutes? I was thinking about how the meeting we had last week and mm -hmm. I recognize that's a really mature conversation. And, and maybe that's something that a junior person needs to practice with a coach rather yeah. than with the don't practice on your boss. <laughs> You might find you might find that the boss just doesn't work that way. Um, so, yeah. so if you've got the opportunity to um, to to find a, a mentor or a coach, yeah, that that would be probably be the place to try it. <laughs> and then pluck up the courage to uh, ask. But I think that's a really good really good advice about a starting point of just having a conversation that isn't about you know your to do list effectively. Um, yeah, great idea. 
What and asking it? for yeah, asking for people's advice because people love giving advice, don't they? Look, I'm doing yeah. it right now. That's you know, true. there's nothing to the oh, I I know something here, and so ask your boss for their advice about how they best would like to receive your uh, your input. And the the sector, I mean, let's let's be positive about this. We have an opportunity in sport to inspire people coming out of the COVID shutdown, COVID situation. And if we play our cards right as sport, we can actually create opportunities rather than uh, rather than closing in on ourselves. We should be opening up, and, and, yeah. and that, you know, I'm a, I tend to be a positive, forward-looking person. And if we can get enough positivity in the sport, we know the power of sport. Um, yeah. and there should be opportunities there. Um, I definitely but, agree with that. Yeah, and that's yeah. a nice, that's a really nice message I think for people because I think there is this this worry that it will kind of retract. Leaders Meet Diversity series is all about how do we make it a more inclusive industry to work in, and I, I fear there's this worry that it will sort of kind of close back in on itself. Um, but I, I'd like to think to your point that this is an opportunity. Yeah, I, I think it is. I think it is. I think we have to be careful. Um, I am concerned about uh, the amount of media coverage for women's sports. That's yeah, everything's just fallen off a cliff over the last um, two months. So I I would uh, put a plea out, and I do this to the to the media is, you know, you were doing a great job in terms of increasing coverage of women's sports, and we need that to continue. So um, the fortunately, some of the international federations that we're investing in a big way in, in um, women's sports. So like rugby and cricket are continuing to, yeah. to put those statements out to say, no, we will continue to invest. But I recognize that, you know, when you're right down to a grassroots roots level or perhaps the next level up, the first level of professional sport. And if you've got a choice between keeping a men's team running that you might get some revenues in or a women's team, mm. that's a really hard decision. But but if with the support from those overarching bodies to say, right, this is an opportunity to, um, to if you like, to make those changes, to move forward in, a, in, a, in, a, in an equitable way, then, then that's visionary and, and that can be very exciting. But uh, yeah, we, we, we've, we, uh, right now, I'm very concerned about the coverage of women's sport because there are stories there. There are a lot of human stories there. And yeah. I think the, the main media are missing those at the moment. Yeah. Well, let's put that out into the world. <laughs> I hope that someone, yes. someone yes. catches it. <laughs> I hope that some of, yeah, some of our leaders can help solve that problem with me. Uh, that would be yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. So just to round off then, thinking about, um, I was thinking about what you were saying around what young people or people who are at the start of their career can, can look to do during this time, because it, it certainly will be a more competitive um, market, you know, in terms of, of jo a jobs market. What, what do you look for in, in, your, in your team in terms of the behaviours and the skills that you look for um, for people who are looking to progress up, the, up within the industry? So um, demonstrating their, their interest, um, mm. you know, when they're, whether it's through uh, a letter, a CV, a contact, a telephone call, um, and um, to, you know, to do doing research beforehand. I know it sounds really boring, but it works. Um, mm. Lining lining up your experience, thinking about what experience you have and what makes you interested in sport. So we all want interest. We all want interesting different people that can yeah. be fit as part of a team. So so if you work out where what your fit is, because you're you're probably going to be asked in a, if you're if you get the opportunity to go for an interview. Um, where would you, where would you see your strengths being? Um, and um, it might be you might not get that job. You might tell them all about your strengths, and um, and it might be because that just wasn't the strengths they were looking for. So don't be despondent if you get turned away, because the more practice you get, the better you will be. And when you do find the 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 the, the, the organisation, whether it's a media organization whether it's journal you know journalism whether it's sports events whether it's an international federation a national governing body national association when 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 that when that comes together that's the sweet spot where actually mm -hmm. you're going to be best so, so there's no you don't need to get despondent if somebody turns you away because it probably wasn't the right job for you anyway yeah um, you know, 
think about what you're good at. Ask your family, ask, uh, ask, ask your friends. What do, what, what do, where do you see me happiest? Um, mm. I, and it's those, you know, then you won't spend your early part of your career fighting against your natural inclination. Yeah. Uh, so find, find what makes you happy. And um, yeah, if, if, if there's a challenge to earn money generally, you might as well be happy and earning no money as opposed to unhappy and earning no money. <laughs> That's very true. Very true. And I, I agree with you that often people think of job interviews as a one way thing, but actually there are two way thing. You know, if, it, if you're having a job interview or you're working out if the job's right for you, it's just as much about them as it is about you really. Um, so I think that's great advice. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. And I guess one last question, what are you most excited about in a sort of post lockdown, post COVID pandemic world? Are you excited about how this might have changed some things? Uh, yeah, I, th I think, I mean, one of the things we have had is um, a little bit of time um, calling it transitional space for thinking. And so with the board, we've been developing our new strategic plans. So I'm really excited about starting to talk with and engage our members into that planning process. So, uh, so that's really exciting. We've got some roadshows um, starting next week with all of our regions. We've never done this before. Zoom roadshows, you see? We're innovating, yeah. we're touching base, we're, we're checking up, you know, we're finding out, we've done some research about where all our members are at right now in terms mm -hmm. of their, their, you know, their um, stability, their sustainability, I should say, their, you know, are they emerging from lockdown now? We've got some countries going back, returning to netball, we've got, uh, in the Oceania region, Nepal, and yeah. New Zealand and Australia. So, so we are starting to emerge. So we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And that's very exciting. I guess the day I hand my passport over to check in, that's going to be pretty exciting. Yeah. <laughs> and I know oh, that sounds dreadful. We shouldn't just think about traveling on planes, but no. I've always loved traveling. I've, I've yeah. always loved the plane journey, so I can't, I can't deny it. So <laughs> that's <laughs> um, good to yeah, and um, just it's been great to reflect on things that are important and trying to carry those through and you know yeah. make sure we keep all the good stuff um, when we go through. Yeah, I agree. So that's that's what we're looking forward, forward to. for sure. Yeah, yeah Laura, how about you? I mean, you must be thinking yourself with leaders. What, what what's changed? What's the new leaders? Uh, well, yeah, I think to your point, it's reflective time, isn't it? Really, um, and it's kind of we're sort of terming it forced innovation, and that's a good thing. So I, I'm totally in agreement with you that it's about having a positive mindset about what the what the future holds and and how you can add value in in whatever the new normal looks like. Um, and I, if we all think like that, I, I'd, I'm, I'm an optimist like you that that's got to have the, the, best, the best possible result. Um, um, our team vision, because uh, we have a colleague in Namibia, she keeps telling us about when she's taking it, when she's going to take a squad biking on the sand dunes in Namibia. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's... We'll, we'll have something where we can come back together as a team and it'll be a great reunion. But... <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, Claire, thank you so much for your time and really appreciate you kicking off our very first chain conversation.